Hi, and welcome to problem session one. So as you might have noticed in this problem session, it's no different from the lectures in that there actually is no video associated with this problem session. Um, the reason is, if you've noticed, um, because of the way they, you know, the, the recording goes, you can't actually um, have notes in front of me when doing a lecture. So I have to have it all in my head. And the problem sessions are going to be doing a lot of problems, and because of that, it's a little difficult to... Um, have all those problems in my head at once, so instead I'm going to have notes in front of me, which I can read, and since you don't need to be watching me read notes, I'm just going to have the screen only here. Um, which you can just look at the screen and look at the problems directly and not have to be distracted by my staring at notes. Okay, so here you go. Um, and also different is these, these problem sessions are not broken up into modules like the actual um, lectures themselves. They're just um, a single problem session of hopefully I'm going to try to keep it to about 15 minutes each or less for each lecture to help you go through and get some um, extra practice in doing the problems. The main purpose of these problem sessions is to provide you with a place to go. If you get stuck in the problem set, you're not sure how to do something, the problem sessions will offer you a decent, although not complete, but a decent um, range of example problems to work on. Note, you can also go through and do the problems in the textbook, and the problems. some of the problems in the textbook have it worked out for you in detail, and those worked out solutions are available on the this videos and books webpage. Um, you can download those and get some work solutions as well. Okay, so with that prelude um, done, we're going to start with lecture one. Now lecture one as you might have noticed, is the sort of least cohesive lecture in the sense that there's a lot of different material going on. Um, it's a lot of stuff that you've probably seen at one point or other in your life, but all put in one place to have it be more complete and to you know satisfy our claim of starting from the beginning. So we're going to go through in this problem session. There's a bunch of small problems just designed to give you a sense of how to go about doing the problem sets in this lecture. Okay, so first um, concept well, not necessarily the first, but the, one of the concepts in this lecture, one of the first ones, is the notion of a constant versus a variable. Right? A constant versus a variable. What's an example of that? Um, well, a constant, it's just something that doesn't change, we said in the lecture. Um, so, for instance, location of Seattle. Seattle, Washington, um, in the U.S. is a constant. It does not change. It's a single location. It's a constant location. In contrast, if we had a variable, we could have the variable location of survey respondents. Okay. So this is a variable because it's location of it's the recorded location of anyone who responds to a survey, and that can vary across people. So that's a variable. Similarly, you could think of a similar kind of distinction between a value and a variable. A value is a particular um, case of a variable. So a variable might be, um, you know, the outcome of votes of no confidence in a parliamentary system. Whereas a particular vote might be a value. So a particular um, no confidence vote, that's a vote for no confidence, for a lack of confidence, would be a value. So again, a value is just a, just a particular case, a realization of a variable. Okay. Um, then in the lecture, we talked about different levels of measurement. So we had nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. So let's just really quickly go through some of those. Um, so the first step you should ask yourself is, do you have categories or numbers? If you have numbers, then it's interval or ratio. Numbers being like 2, 3, or 4, or whatever, 5.2. If you have numbers, is there a 0? If there's a 0, um, then it's a ratio. If you have numbers and there's no set 0, then it's an interval type of variable. If you have categories, um, is there a rank order? If there's categories, is there a rank order? If there's a rank order, so you can order the categories, it's ordinal. And if there's no if there's no rank ordering for your categories, it's nominal. Let's remind you of what we did in the lecture. Um, so give some examples. You could have income in numbers. So if I listed income as just a number, 
um, you know, know thirty six thousand dollars. That's a ratio. You could have zero income. Um, so that's a ratio ratio level of measurement. However, if I had quartiles, um, so say lower twenty five percent income, and then next twenty five, the next twenty five, and then upper twenty five percent. That's income in quartiles. That's an ordinal level of measurement because you have categories, right? Um, but they're ordered. Lower twenty five percent is less than upper twenty five percent. Um, and this wouldn't be next twice. That's just um, next, first next, <laughs> second next. That is different. Okay. Um, you could have location, right? So the location from east to west might give you some nominal category, a nominal level of measurement. You know, I live in the east, I live in the west, whatever. Or you could actually measure um, location on a GPS, you know, down to particular, you know, very small values of longitude and latitude, in which case you have an actual um, into a ratio um, type of variable. You have a number. You could also distinguish between discrete and continuous variables. Um, the income rounded up to dollars versus continuous income. So for instance, if I had income like this, um, and I had a report income in tens or twenties or whatever, that would be a discrete variable. Whereas if I could break income down to 10.2131 1, blah blah forever, that's a continuous variable. It can take any value between two points, whereas a discrete um, variable is forced to take values um, on you know discrete values basically. One, two, three, or whatever. Right. Um, so that's the sort of general level of measurement stuff. We can move to sets now. Some set ideas. Let's start off with some examples. And by the most problem sessions would not be sort of repeating material from the lecture, but go straight to examples. In this case, though, it's hard to set up examples without repeating a little bit. Okay. So here are two sets, um, the open set 6 to 8 and the closed set 7 to 9. We can ask some questions about them. So here's one semi-complicated example of a set um, application. What is that? Well, the first thing here, um, that means subtract effect. That's a difference, a set difference. That means take the difference between A and A um, intersection B. That thing here, that upside down U, is the intersection. So what this says is first, because the parentheses are on the second part, do this first. This says first intersect A and B, and then subtract that from A. So what's the intersection of A and B? Well, it's the overlap. Right, so if you have a number line here, here's six, here's eight, there's a. Um, if here's seven, here's nine, there is b. I should change colors. Um, so I could do that. <laughs> b is the red one. And now we can make the blue one the overlap, which is this region here. Therefore, this thing is going to equal. 7, 8. Right. Now I subtract that from A. So that leaves, so I have A and I get rid of that blue part. Um, that will leave the green part over here, left over in A, which is going to be 6, 7. So this whole thing equals 6, 7. Okay, there you go. So that's an um, example of some set stuff, and you can do more stuff with this, but basically keep track of what elements are in what sets, and you'll be fine. Now moving on to a totally different topic again, <laughs> simplification. So let's assume, assuming x does not equal plus or minus 3, can we simplify this example here? And by the way, these problem sets um, are problem sessions meant to help you. So the same notation, the same comment applies from the lectures. If you're going too fast, stop. <laughs> pause the tape. Pause, pause the tape. Pause the video. Um, look at you know what's on the screen and think through it before moving on. Okay, So how do we simplify this expression? As in most of these cases, we're going to be factoring. Let's try to factor both parts. Um, the top, the, the um, numerator, let's take a 4 out first. That leaves 4x squared minus 9. We're distributing out the 4, taking out the 4. Well, x squared minus 9 is a perfect square. It's not a perfect square, I'm sorry. It's a I apologize, it's not a perfect square. What it is, is that. 
to the plus and the minus. Um, if you if you have no x in a quadratic, right? So if you have an x squared and a and a m constant, you're often going to have a plus or minus um, root. Okay. Now, what's the bottom? The bottom is a perfect square. It's x plus three squared. So one of the x plus three is cancel, and we're left with four x minus three divided by x plus three. And that's simplified. Note that um, this only works if you um, have x not equal to minus three in particular, because if it's x equal to minus three, then that's something over zero, it goes to infinity, it doesn't work out. Okay, so there's an example there. Moving on from that to another example. Now we're going to expand using FOIL. And again, I apologize for the completely random nature of this problem session. As you noted, we're going to this lecture. It's a little bit of a hodgepodge. Um, later lectures don't have the same character. <laughs> okay, so um, if we can FOIL, let's do an example of that. 5x plus 1, 2x minus 10. What's FOIL? First is first. What's the first one? Well, it's the first one in each of the parentheses. That's 5x times 2x is 10x squared. Then the next one is the outer. The outer is the um, outer parts of the parentheses. So the out this is outer and outer. So that's going to be negative 50x. Then the um, inner. You know what? I should color code this thing. So the outer is here. And the first is here, and the inner is going to be the two inner ones, which are here and here. So the inner is 2x. And finally, the last, which is the last one in both cases, is going to be negative 10. So putting this together, we end up with um, 10 squared minus 50x plus 2x is minus 48x total minus 10. There you go. And now we've gone out and done that. So, another example done. <laughs> um, now we're going to complete the square and solve for x. So here we're moving to, into solving for um, single variable equations. We'll do multivariate ones much later in the linear algebra part. Here's an equation. How do we complete the square? Let's first add 5 to both sides. That gives us x squared plus 2x equals 5. Now we know that 2 over 2 squared equals 1. So let's add 1 to both sides. So plus 1 plus 1 gives us x squared plus 2x plus 1 equals 6. This left side is now a perfect square. It's x plus 1 squared equals 6. Take the square root, um, so we get x plus 1 equals plus or minus the square root of 6. Remember that means it could be plus 6 or minus 6. So that's plus the square root of 6 or minus the square root of 6. You can't tell which one it is because it's a, the square root. When you square plus the square root of 6, you get 6. When you square minus the square root of 6, you get 6. So either way, it's 6. Um, now we're going to subtract 1 um, to get x equals negative 1 plus or minus the square root of 6. There you go. So that's how you do that. You could also use the quadratic formula. I'm going to stick this in the very bottom here because it's the same problem, and I want you to have, be able to look at the same problem on the same page. The quadratic formula says negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a is going to equal to x. There's the roots. So if we plug it in here. a, from this, back in the beginning here, right, the very first one, a is 1 b is 2, so that's negative 2, um, plus or minus the square root of 4, so 2 squared is 4, minus 4 times 1, that's a, times negative 5 is c, divided by 2 times 1, we get negative 2, so negative 2, um, plus or minus the square root of 4 plus 20 is 24, all over 2. The square root of 24 is equal to the square root of 4 times 6. You pull the square root of 4 out, the square root of 4 is 2. So you end up with um, negative 2 plus or minus 2 times the square root of 6 over 2. And when you divide 3 by 2, you end up with the thing you got back again. So you could have used the quadratic formula 2 if you wanted to. 
Either way works just fine. I usually find the quadratic formula always works, and it's easier than having to try to complete the square every time. So I almost always just default to the quadratic formula, but you can do whatever you want. And that's it. That was the problem session for um, lecture one. Thank you very much.